Good morning. We'll be doing scripture reading on Proverbs 22, verse 6. That will be found in the Pew Bibles, two, or 603. Train up your child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. Amen? Amen. All right. Well, since I've already been introduced, we'll just get right to it. Did you guys know that when you entered kindergarten, almost all of you, 98% of you, were at genius level? That's true. There's research, a longitude study that says so. So what happened? <laughs> Our text today, I'm going to share it with you again from the Amplified Version. It says, train up a child in the way he should go. And we kind of think that's like making them go to church or teaching them to go to Sabbath school, those kinds of things. But according to the Septuagint, which is the original translation from the Greek to English, it means something more like this. In keeping with the individual bent or gift, something that we're wired to be. So we train that child to be what the gift is that God gave them. And when they are old, they will still do it. So you think again a little bit about yourself. Are you doing what God wired you to be? Did you do that in your work? Are you doing that in your work? Are we guiding our children that way? Those are all questions that we want to talk about. Albert Meyer says that education is a conversation between the older and the younger generation about what is important. I'm going to get my notes here. I wasn't sure if I could see the PowerPoint, but it's too far away. I just don't have those super peepers anymore. We're also told that the subject of education is one that, every, that should interest every Seventh-day Adventist. So we're going to talk a little bit about it today. And the essential question, is Adventist education still relevant today? Some say yes, some say no. So we're going to talk about it just a little bit. Let's go back to we entered kindergarten as geniuses. What happened? Well, we're beginning to figure out some of the reasons or what has happened. And one of them might be about how we're taught or how we're not taught. There is a natural cycle of learning of how the brain learns. And I'm going to get out the sample here of a brain. Let's see here. Let's see if I can set it here well enough for you guys to see it. <clears throat> Maybe like that's a little better. And when we learn, there's actually a God-given process we go through. So we take in information back here. This part of the brain gets activated when a new experience comes along. And then it moves through and it comes down to the bottom part here, kind of inside the core. And we think about it and we analyze it. And then it moves here to the front where it's our common sense thinking and, and those kinds of deals. And we begin to figure out what we're going to do with it. And up here, we finally do something with it. And so it completes a, a cycle. Well, 
Many of you may already know that uh, David Kolb discovered this natural cycle some time ago. It's been around a while. But even though we know about it, we haven't done a whole lot with it intentionally. And I want to talk a little bit more about this cycle and how it fits with you. Because even though there's the cycle, it comes in here, goes this way and this way, each of us have a preference of where we like to function. Some of us like it here better. Some of us like it down here better. Some of us prefer here. And some of us prefer there. And none of them are better than the other. They're all important, even though we do the whole thing but we have a preference that we default to when we have a choice. And so do our children. So here is a little bit more about what those preferences are. And just for ease, sake of ease, they just numbered them one, two, three, and four. So it's easy to remember. The people who prefer right here, they're the imaginative learners. They're the ones that like relationships. These people are the analytical learners. They want to know what the facts are and what did the experts say. These people here are the ones that want to get the job done. They're the common sense people and say, well, that doesn't make sense. We just need to do it this way, and let's get it done. And these people here are the dynamic learners. They're the ones that say, well, what if we did it this way? Or what if we tried this? And they're the ones that kind of change the world. So as we went through this, can you find yourself, or maybe your spouse, or your child, or your grandchild. Let's look at them one more time so you can kind of think about where you might prefer. And I'll say it in just a little different way. That might help you. Type 1, peop uh, type one mind style prefers people and relationships. It's like you want to talk things over with your friends. You want to know how everybody's going to feel about this particular decision. Those things are critical and important. And they are. The type two, people say, well, what are the facts? I want to know all the information. Do we have everything we need to know so that we can make a good decision? Those are important things. Type three, are ready to get at the task and think about the practicality of the whole application and the whole decision. And we need those people, too. And then the type four people, they want new and better ideas to make a better world. And sometimes they go a little outside the box and it worries some of the other mind styles. So could you kind of maybe find yourself in some of those? Now we do them all and some of us have a couple of them that could be very close. Well, the reason why I'm telling you this is because I want to share with you that Dr. Bernice McCarthy developed a framework that we call FORMAT that helps education develop lessons that take us naturally through this cycle of learning. So the beginning of the lesson would, would connect them with an experience and they move all the way through until it actually becomes something that they can apply in the real world. It engages both sides of the brain and the whole cycle. So it's according to how God made us to learn, because we don't really learn any other way. School is mostly made up of addressing this mind style right here. Even in this day and age, it's still a lot right here. And so we have students going to school that fall in these areas that are 
right here, pushed into this area, and it's, it's hard for them, or they don't like it, or they maybe misbehave, or they find something else to do. It doesn't have anything to do with IQ. We kind, of, we kind of, in this culture, value this mind style, and if people know a lot of facts and information, we think they're really smart. Well, they are in a way, but there's all other kinds of intelligences. One of our academies over on the East Coast, Madison Academy, decided that they would take a look at their students and the different mind styles, what percentage was represented, and, and see if it was affecting anything in what was going on in their classroom. So you see here, 43% of the school were ones. Those are the people who like relationships and their friends. And they're going to learn by talking about it with their classmates. 16% were twos. These are the ones that like to get the information. To give them the book. They love to take the book and look for the facts and the information. Here are the threes. They have a hard time sitting still in the classroom. It's like we would like to do something with this, or this doesn't even make sense. And they learn by hands-on learning. And then here are the fours. And they just make it regardless. And some of the time people think they're out, out in far away land somewhere because they have all kinds of ideas that doesn't seem to connect to the rest of these people. Well, they decided, let's take a look at, the, um, at these students by honor roll, now that we know how many are in here. If I can hit the right button. All right, so the type one, oh, there are 70% of them on the honor roll. Look at type two, all of them were on the honor roll. Type three, okay, about 70%. Type four, oh well, not so many. So they thought, okay, let's look at the standardized test. And again, you can see, I won't go through each of them, but you can see the green one is the two, the type two. The type four is the lowest one. The others fit somewhere in between on the standardized testing. Then they decided to look at attendance to class for unexcused tardinesses and absence. And again, you can see the fours don't really care a whole lot. <laughs> it's like, okay. And the ones, they'll come to class if their friends are there. The twos, they're going to come. They want to know the information. And the threes, well, it depends on what's going on probably. Let's see, so then they said, let's look at discipline incidences. Look at that. So we're beginning to think a little bit differently about maybe what's going on in our classrooms and in, in school with our kids. And let's see, I think we have one more slide here. Oh, the grade point average. Well. And not so bad, considering. So some of them figure out how to do it in spite of everything. When they shared this information, when Madison Academy shared this information with Dr. McCarthy, who is out of Chicago, she said, we need to do a, a, a same kind of thing with a couple of other schools. So they took and they went to Hawaii, right here, and took 1,900 students, did the same kind of thing. And you can see, and here is North Dakota, you can see that the percentage division is fairly similar. So it's fairly safe to conclude that most students in school, the least a number of students in school, are twos probably in the public school system and in our system, private school system, it's just kind of the way it seems to be. 
Now, it's not conclusive, of course, because it's not a population representative, but it, it does give us an idea. So the thought comes to my mind that what if a school taught equally? Oops, whoops, I missed one. <laughs> Let me just say this. You've all heard cognitive genesis, about the cognitive genesis study, and you've all heard that we excel in all areas, and we do. But I'm thinking, it might be the twos that are carrying a lot of that score. Maybe. And they're the minority of our students. So I'm thinking, what if we had a school that taught equally to all mind styles, addressed all four of them? That cycle of learning that's designed by God, how our brains actually work. In Desire of Ages, we're told that there are many people, or many are unconscious of talents they may, that they possess. These talents, if properly developed, would raise them to equality with the world's most honored. How many students, how many children have we missed because we didn't understand? One touch of a skillful hand is needed to arouse those dormant facilities or faculties. So we need skilled educators who partner with God because he understands the cycle of how we learn. But we need educators who understand that cycle too and they can partner with God to make this happen. So I want to tell you what we're doing at Crescenta Valley this next year, because it's very exciting. We're going to begin in, in teacher study groups imp learning how to implement the natural cycle of learning in the instruction in the classroom. And it sounds very difficult, and it's kind of hard to learn to develop the lessons, but we have a lesson bank that teachers can pull from and they can share so it lightens the load. We've been in the process of doing a total school makeover. Some very neat things are happening over there, and you, in the next couple, three weeks, you need to come by and see it. When we have open house, come and see what we've done. We're going to be clarifying the mission and the vision of the school. We're working for a better focus on customer service. We want to become a model school, the school of choice for the community, where everyone wants to go. And they want to partner more closely with their constituency churches, which means you. But we need your help. One more thing I want to tell you. Why? Is Crescenta Valley Adventist School so important? Not only because of the things I just told you about, but there's another thing that's even more important. George Barna did some research on children and where they make decisions, at what age and what happens. And here's what his research says. The moral perce perceptions or moral foundations for a child are in place by age nine. They determine what is right and wrong by age nine. And the trans they translate morals to behavior. They figure out what they believe and what is moral and what they should how they should act by age nine. That's pretty young. Children's faith commitments are sealed in their minds by age 13. Their perceptions of God are there by age 13. 
the heart of their theological perceptions are established by age 13. What they believe by age 13 is what they will die believing. Now, yes, we know there's a few exceptions. There are adults who give their heart to Jesus for the first time. But as a general rule, it doesn't happen. And in fact, here are the percentages and the probabilities of the whole deal. The probability of people accepting Jesus as their Savior for a lifetime relationship is 32% for children between the ages of 5 and 13. Now, we're really talking about a return on investment here. So think about that. 4% for children between 14 and 18. Now, this is according to George Barna's research, which you can look up. You can get his book. Just Google George Barna, and you'll find several things. And 6% for people 19 and older. Now, I'm looking out here in the crowd this morning, and I'm going to guess that there's a good chance that a lot of you gave your heart to Jesus between the ages of 5 and 13. Either that or we're really an exceptional church. But how many of you all gave your heart to Jesus between the ages of 5 and 13? Can I see your hands? I was one of them. Yeah, we got quite a few. The Bible tells us to be careful and watch ourselves closely so we don't forget the things that we know and we've experienced and that we teach them to our children diligently. Sometimes we think maybe they'll just pick it up or sometimes maybe we forget to talk about it. We're also told that as long as time shall last, we shall have need of schools. There will always be need of education. But we must be careful, lest education absorb every spiritual interest. Again, with that return on investment, the 35%, that's pretty significant. Adventist education is more than a luxury. It is an Adventist essential. Therefore, it is a responsibility that the Seventh-day Adventist Church owes its children. After all, the children are the future of our church. And if we're not ensuring that they have that opportunity, that 35% chance window to give their hearts to Jesus and develop a lifelong relationship with Him, we're contributing to the death of our church. And it is a serious issue. We are an aging church. And it's, 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 it's been a little a few years, maybe five years, since I looked at the statistics, but it used to be that the average age of the Adventist mem church member in North America was about 58, so it's probably 60-something now. The average median age for people in at the whole United States was like 34 years of age. So we're an elderly church. Then out of that, 20% of those churches have no children in them, which means in a very short time those churches will not exist. We have some seri serious things to consider about what's happening in our, in our church, our obligation and our connection with our schools and what they can do. So I ask you again, is Adventist education still relevant today? And I would say, absolutely. Yes, it is. So my question to you is, what will you do? And I'd like you to listen to this song.
I went to church again today Looked at all the fine array Not many little faces did I see They must be taught from the start They must have Jesus in their heart Oh, where are the children? Where are the children? Is Satan stealing them away? Are we too blind to see today? Remember Jesus said it best When I return will I find faith Oh, where are the children? Where are the children? When at last we've run our race Who'll be there to take our place? Will the house of worship fade away? Amazing grace, and it won't be long When we're gone, who'll sing those songs? Oh, where are the children? Cry for the children Is Satan stealing them away? Are we too blind to see today? Oh, where are the children? Remember Jesus said it best When I return will I find faith? Not so many years have passed But the changes they've been vast This world grows more wicked every day When we get to heaven and we look around Will our children there be found? Oh Is Satan stealing them away? Are we too blind to see today? Oh, where are the children? Remember Jesus said it best When I return will I find faith? Children, where are the children?